Hello and welcome to the Bad Tech. Uh, this is Himal and this is Tamara. Today we have with us uh, a somewhat unusual guest. <laughs> He's an astronomer here by the name of Mahesh Herat. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mahesh, Mahesh Herat, and as I said, I'm an astronomer and I work at the Arthur C. Clarke Center right now, and I'm also affiliated with the Columbia University, with whom I'm actually doing a MPhil. And yeah, so. I'm here to talk about astronomy and planets and oh, other <laughs> and stuff. And various other <laughs> things. Okay. Right. So <laughs> Mahesh was uh, Mahesh made some uh, made uh, headlines recently for his uh, discovery of uh, two, two exoplanets. Yeah. Yes. Uh, shall we jump right into that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So talk us through your discovery. Yeah. So I mean, just a quick recap of what exoplanets are. These mm. are actually planets that are orbiting stars outside of our own solar system. Yeah, right. The study the topic itself has uh, is actually relatively young if you think if you think about it the first discovery was made back in 1992 and even then there was a lot of uncertainty about what they f if whether or not what they found was actually genuinely planets or not but it's only by 1995 that they actually knew these are indeed planets and they made another discovery in 1995 so you could say exoplanetary astronomy is only about 24 25 years old it's pretty new but because of advances in uh, telescope technology and detected technology, it actually took a massive spike in the last 10 years. Just to put it in perspective, pre-2009, they had only discovered about, well, 100, 200, maybe 300 planets at most, if even that many. Post-2009, in the last 10 years, that number has gone up to 4,000 just oh. to give you a perspec uh, right. perspective about what a big spike it has been. And they expect with, an, with increasingly better detectors and uh, te telescopes, that number could easily quadruple in the approaching 10 to 20 years. All right. yeah. What was the reason for su such a dramatic uh, spike? So for starters, one of them is the launch of the Kepler telescope. Right. Mm. So it's a spacecraft, and that's the first time they actually had a a uh, telescope in space specifically designed to actually look for exoplanets and there was another one called Corot, uh, C-O-R-O-T, which is another spacecraft that look, can look for exoplanets and they actually launched another one recently called TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, which is now already making new finds, findings as it is and another one, there are a lot more coming up. And there's also the fact that they actually improved the detector technology on ground-based ones as well. So for example, they have bigger telescopes and better search campaigns that are more focused, more focused on finding planetary objects rather than you know being completely random. So it's a combination of targeting and chance, really. Yeah. So if I'm not mistaken, the Kepler mission specifically was to the, one of the mission objectives is to like uh, find Earth-like planets mm -hmm. around Sun-like stars. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that was one of the main objectives, and you could say to an extent they have managed to do that. But finding Earth-like planets is actually very difficult. Mm. For the purposes of this of that objective, how do you define Earth-like planets and Sun-like stars? Right. So that's actually there. There's a lot of degeneracy in how you actually do that. <laughs> so if we try to condense it. One of the first things you need is the climate around a planet, uh, surrounding a planet like that. Mm. So if you take our star system, Earth is in the perfect area for habitation, called the habitable zone, so there's yeah. that. But it would be different for other stars. Say if you have a star that's cooler than the sun, like say a red dwarf, which would be, so the sun, the surface of the sun is 6,000 Kelvin, approximately, the surface of a red dwarf would be half that amount. So that means in order to have the same kind of conditions you need on Earth, mm. it needs to be closer, closer. to the star. Yeah. yeah. So what takes 365 days for Earth, around a cooler star, you know, you could have the habitable zone for a planet that goes around in like 20 or 30 days. Right. Yeah. And believe it or not, Kepler, not just Kepler, even other survey missions have actually found several planets that meet that criteria. Uh, there, there are actually, there's actually one relatively close to Earth called Ross 128b, which is supposed to be one of the most Earth-like planets. If you look at the other criteria, that's one of them, how close they are, you know, if they are in the habitable zone or not. 
you also need other factors like say for example it needs to be rocky that's at least from what we know it has to be a rocky planet not like jupiter or saturn not so, gaseous yeah not gaseous that's right and it needs to have a a magnetic field so that it can deviate uh particles from a star solar wind High, yeah mm-hmm. yeah solar wind yeah. or stellar wind right. if you're looking at a generalized right stellar yeah. wind yeah so there's that those are two things for it to be earth like but for it to actually have a be habitable and to stay habitable you might actually need something else like for example here's something maybe some people know about this uh, but maybe some don't but jupiter is actually very important for life to exist on earth mm. the reason being jupiter is so large it actually deviates things like mm. comets and asteroids yeah, that's right it's kind of like a massive mm. bodyguard essentially yeah. you know with a big bat that just right. you know knocks away anything that could potentially well not knock away more like draw in anything yeah. that could potentially come this way so it's you need if you have a large planet that's just the right distance where it could you know take away particles from an asteroids comets away from a planet then there's a good chance that there would be enough going on there for life but at the same time it shouldn't be how can i put this too inactive either because inactive in terms of say asteroid impacts right. and things like volcanic er- eruptions right. because on earth things like volcanic eruptions are actually very, a very important part of recycling materials that from deep in the earth mm. up into the atmosphere and at the same time asteroids earlier in earth's life shaped how the earth looked you know what we are like this now in fact our moon exists because of a massive impact mm-hmm. billions of years ago about three and a half to four billion years ago scientists think that an object as big as mars collided with earth and once it broke apart the debris is what formed the moon and the moon is actually a very important part of stabilizing earth's orbit to make sure that it doesn't you know jump around like a drunk maniac on a, on its own axis and this stabilization actually contributes a lot towards maintaining life on earth because if the moon for some reason or another go went away it's very likely that maybe life might not have developed on earth isn't our, our moon moving away already we, yeah it yeah, is actually yeah. moving away but it's so slow that it would right. be millions of years before it's far you know actually billions of years before it's far enough that um it would have a significant effect on life mm. but you know well, yeah i mean let's be honest it's highly unlikely that humans will make 10000 years let alone a billion <laughs> so <laughs> i don't think we need to worry about that much so right. w- would the presence of a satellite be essential for life to begin um, it depends on if life develops the same way it would develop here on earth right uh, i would say yes if there is a satellite it would be certainly be good mm. but then again we are actually basing this on life as we perceive it here right, on earth right but there could be life that are so vastly different to what we expect you might need you know you could have completely different conditions and it might still exist like as an example there is a way you could have life forming on a gas giant yes. on the upper atmosphere yeah. all right uh, if you have maybe uh, life forms small life forms that arise on the upper atmosphere and they evolve in such a way that they can consume things like hydrocarbons in the atmosphere and use hydrogen as a form of metabolism to you know um encourage metal- metab- metabolism in their bodies so you could actually have large life forms that look like like big floating balls or globular things or just basically what jellyfish look like right. okay you could have something like that hypothetically if life develops I remember develops. Stephen Hawking talking about something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh Stephen Hawking and Carl Sagan was actually yeah. quite famous for advocating that theory about, you know, maybe life can form on gas giants. He was very fond of that theory. Um but so far we have not found any evidence for that, but well, I'm guessing we, we don't have any on our gas giants, but there's no telling if there are in others, but the only problem is it's going to be very difficult to detect those would this be organic life or some other kind of we don't know for sure i mean you could theoretically it, yeah I theoretically think. it could be you know you could have organic life mm. like that right but it could be something completely different like silicon based life mm. 
So talk us through the nature of the, these two exoplanets that you helped discover. Yeah, so they are actually larger than Earth. Right. So if you take uh, the respect with relative to the Earth, they're actually 2.5 times larger. Now, if you take our solar system, there is actually a large gap between the rocky planets and the gaseous ones. So Earth is, so respect to the Earth, the next largest one is Neptune. Mm. So Neptune is actually 3.9 times Earth's radius. So this actually puts a very, puts astronomers in a very interesting conundrum. What do you get in between? So you have a rocky planet with Earth and you have a gas giant with Neptune. So what comes in between? We have no frame of reference to know what comes in between. So these planets I found fall firmly in that area through 2.5 Earth radii, yeah. where you don't know if it's rocky or if it's gaseous. Mm. So if I had to have a guess, I would say it's probably something in something like both. So okay. it could have a rocky uh, interior full of uh, metals and rock and maybe a small layer of water followed by a massive gaseous envelope around it. Mm. So think of a billiard ball surrounded by a a big ball of gas like a very thick atmosphere yeah in a very very thick atmosphere right. yeah so what you just explained the fact that these fall somewhere between the mm -hmm. size of earth and neptune is that the yeah. reason they are called sub neptunes yeah that's right okay sub neptunes are pretty much called in that area but if you take earth and you take a radius that's up to 1.8 times earth's, earth's radius mm -hmm. you actually have a kind of planet called super earth right yeah so they think super earths are pretty much rocky. Uh, they're basically larger versions of Earth. So beyond 1.8 Earth radius up to about, yeah, beyond 1.8 to say three Earth radius, no one really knows what's, you know, what kind of planets they are. Because beyond three, it's extremely likely they're gaseous. Mm -hmm. About, I would say, 90 to 95% likely they're gaseous. But between 1.8 mm -hmm. Earth radius and three, there's a little more mystery as to what they're like. So that's why sub-Neptunes are studied, are very interesting places to study about what planets are like. Uh, there is actually a, very, uh, a certain interesting type of planet that could potentially account for certain sub-Neptunes called ocean planets. They are basically planets that are surrounded entirely in water. So we have a, on Earth, we, our surface is 70% water. On this, it would be 100%. But, and while on Earth, the deepest point, the Mariana Trench, is about 11 kilometers deep, on such an ocean planet, it could be much, much deeper. I'm talking about not 11 kilometers. It could be anything between 50 kilometers and 150 kilometers deep. So that's what you call, well, some astronomers call it water worlds, but I prefer calling it ocean planets because water world reminds me of a certain Kevin Costner movie, which I didn't <laughs> really like. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, ocean planets are... Uh, hypothesized to be a certain right. candidate for what sub-Neptunes are. Is, is, is it a hypothesis or has it been firmly established that they exist? It's a hypothesis, okay, but right. there's increasing evidence that it, they, this type of planet might actually be there. Okay. Because there is a planet called GJ1214b, which they found in 2009. So the mass of that planet is seven Earth masses, roughly speaking, and it's 2.6 times Earth's radius. So the density you get, actually, it's less dense than rock, but more dense than the kind of gas you have on Neptune and Uranus. So it's something that falls in between, and having a, a layer of water corresponds to that. But even more importantly, in 2013, for that planet, they actually found significant amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. So they, did, uh, they studied the spectrum from that planet, and they found out that the spectrum contains signatures for water vapor, a lot of water vapor. So this alone isn't confirmation that it's full of water, but, it's a, but it definitely means that from some form or another, water does exist there. Either you know, it's completely gaseous or it could be that there, are, you know, there could be a watery ocean in it because they say if there is a watery ocean in a planet like that, one signature mm. would be that the atmosphere will have a lot of water vapor. Mm. So it's possible, but not entirely certain. Even recently, actually, maybe you came across it a, a few months ago, they found water vapor on another planet called K218. Yeah. Um, 
that's also not that different from this GJ 1214B. And the planets we found are very much similar in size. One of them orbits this star in 13 days. Mm. So we found the temperature, the equilibrium temperature, which is the temperature you get just outside the planet. In centigrade, it's about 250. Is it 250, 538? It's 260, about 260 degrees centigrade. So that's extremely warm. So I, I, I think there's no question that that not place a candidate is, for is, is not a good candidate for life, at least on first appearances. But the second planet in that same system actually orbits further away. It has a 65-day orbit. It takes 65 days to go around this star. The temperature just outside the planet in that situation is 42 degrees centigrade, which is the kind of temperatures we're getting in Australia right now. It, that's actually pretty pretty decent, I would mm. say. But this is not into ta this is not taking into account an atmosphere. So there could be an if there is an atmosphere, it would be different. Uh, it could either be slightly warm or slightly colder, depending on what kind of atmosphere if it is. There's definitely an atmosphere, but it depends on what kind of atmosphere it is. So from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the atmosphere is, like the contents of the atmosphere is determined by analyzing the light emitting from the star, is that the yes, spectrum? Yes, spectrum. Okay. So what happens is when the planet crosses the star, the light goes through the atmosphere, and while the light is going through the atmosphere, the light from the star gets absorbed by that one and then gets re-emitted. And you can actually see what, you know, what, the, uh, what was absorbed, you know, what kind of material there is. So you need to look at a, tra it's called a transmission spectrum. At the moment, we actually, it's a little too dim, the mm. star we found, the planets, the star around which these planets orbit. But they are building better spectrographs. So maybe in about five, six years, I think we'll have the spectrographs good enough to actually study these planets in more details to see what kind of atmospheres they have. Uh, yeah. Also, this, by the way, this star is orange. It's uh, an orange-colored star. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. it's, called an, it's called an orange dwarf. Uh, how far away is it again? 1,000 light years. 1,000 yeah. light years, okay. The star is called uh, Epic uh, 2127374443. Yeah. 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 Is there anything like special about that star? Um, there are something special about the planets, not the star itself. Right. Uh, that being, this is actually one of the few very few systems where, at least for Kepler, where you found a planet orbiting much further than 50 days. So, because those are pretty hard to find because Kepler only observes for 80 days. Yeah, so it's hard to find anything longer than 40 days. They are pretty rare. How far apart are the two planets? There's about uh, 0.1, 0.3. So there's about, there's a good several million kilometers distance. But here's the thing. So most planets, most multi-planet systems that have been found, they, they have been compact. So when I say compact, what I mean is the planets are ta packed tightly together, together. Say, for example, if you take a regular system, you would have a planet orbiting at three days, another one at six days, another one at nine days, 10 days, 12 days. So close together, compact system. They're all condensed, you know, tightly packed. But this one is not like that. This one, the two planets are very far apart. So it's a little anomalous in terms of what Kepler has found and what you know most surveys have found as a whole, because there is a because one of the reasons why our paper was accepted about this planetary system is because we actually uh, found this little interesting tidbit that a lot of planetary systems are bound to be compact, especially ones that have planets that orbit in less than like 20 days. So there is a possibility that this system might have had more planets in between the first and the second one, but were thrown out at some point. Like right. ejected from, ejected the, from okay. the system, yeah. What would cause something like that? Uh, very often, it so it could be something maybe during the formation phase. You know, when the planets were forming, you get an instability, you okay. get an unstable situation with so many planets going around and sometimes right. they get thrown out. Or it could also be there's a, there could have been a companion star, a second star nearby. So if there's a second star, it you know wreaks all kinds of havoc with the gravity in that system, in that area. And sometimes planets that are not stable just get thrown out. When you say second star, do you mean it could have been a binary system? Yeah. Oh, okay. So sometimes you could have really dim binaries 
you know stars right. that, like I said this star is already already pretty dim as it is so if there's an even dimmer companion nearby there's no way for us to know if there if you know if it's there or not Sirius do you know that Sirius actually has a second companion I mean we all know Sirius as the brightest star in the sky but there's actually a second star very close to it Sirius is actually binary too it's just that the its binary companion is a white dwarf and it's really small and it's not very bright so it's kind of you know we you, you, we can't detect it in the same way we can detect Sirius unless we have a good telescope you know to observe with so there are stars where you think it's one but it's actually two because the other companion is just too dim like kind of like a silent partner essentially yeah okay so mahesh from like start to finish very briefly if you could walk us through the discovery process of these two particular planets right so kepler once they actually do the observations they actually put all the data online okay because the kepler data is open source and okay pretty much anyone can access it if they don't know what to do with it. Right. So mm. what we did was actually we didn't know where to look for something. Mm. So we took a lot of files um before we found came across this system we actually went through 30,000 data files. So we had to actually had to make an al- make an algorithm for that to go from file to file one by one one by one and you have to put in this al- there's this thing called a, a, there's a search algorithm that looks for specific signals of the possible signature you would get when a planet goes in front of a star because the search method we use is something called transit photometry so if you imagine say for example you have a lighthouse some guy walks across the mm. beacon of the lighthouse you're going to see a small dimming effect right the light the amount of light goes down same principle here if a planet is going around a star when the planet crosses the face of the star the light reduces it's like when you see a transit of venus or transit of mercury when that happens the amount of light you receive from that star goes down and the kepler telescope is sensitive enough to detect that in really far away systems where when a planet goes across the star there is a a measurable reduction in the light from it so that's the technique we used here so we you look at signals that indicate there is a dimming because of a planet so we look for those we look for those signals that's what it's a, this search algorithm did look for look for that p- particular kind of signal in all those files after it narrows them down so from 30000 to say something like 5 500 because for every 100 observations you might give t- maybe one if it's actually less for every 10000 observations you might get one or two uh where there are genuine planets around them you have to do a lot of searching and the search algorithms pick up on this right but then afterwards we actually have to do another step because sometimes another star going across the star that we are looking at can have can have the same effect and sometimes it could be something as simple as maybe a star spot a sun spot on that star or maybe a certain I an object know, <laughs> yeah, some kind of object. <laughs> yeah. It could be something as simple as a I don't know like a bug or something, I don't know. Oh, I was thinking <laughs> extraterrestrial object. No, that could be too. There was a there was a there was a certain yeah. incident a few years back. Yeah. I'll get to that if there's time. Called Tabby's star if anybody wants to google that and you'll find some interesting stuff about, about Tabby's star. Yeah, so there could be a lot of false signals. There are more false mm. signals than genuine signals. So that 500 we have to look at which ones are actually genuine so that 500 gets narrowed down to about i don't know maybe 10 or 15 after we are through with it and then we do another survey to see which ones are interesting that are worth looking at then it gets narrowed down to maybe two or three and we looked at this one because of the disparity between how f- you know how far the planets are then afterwards we actually have to do more work on it for example we have to measure the changes in the brightness and from that change in brightness you can actually tell how big the planet is what the orbital period of the planet is how far that planet is from the star if the orbit of that planet is inclined or not so you can tell all those things and you can uh, you can have a rough estimate of how massive the planet is i i say rough because you need a direct measurement for that uh the estimates we get are using statistical methods called uh, mass radius relations like say for example if you have this radius statistically speaking what kind of mass it could have like that 
but you need direct measure measurements in order to know for sure what the mass is. Otherwise, it's only uh, a, you know a hypothesized measurement. But everything else we get by looking at the transit are pretty much genuine. And we have to do that measurement, and then we have to do something called a false probability assessment to see what the probability of this signal, all these measurements are false. What, how much is that probability? And in order for it to be you know, be genuine, it has to be less than 1%, as in the probability of it being a false signal has to be less than 1%. If it's 1.1%, the people, the scientists would say, mm, there's a chance that this might be false. If it's less than 1%, then that means there is a chance that it's very likely to be a planet. And just out of curiosity, if in case anyone's curious, the probability we got were some like not point not 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 seven percent. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So it's de they're definitely they're both definitely <laughs> planets. <laughs> yeah. how, how long did this entire process take? So <coughs> we came across the signals in April 2018, around that time, and we were completely confident it's a planet by around December January December mm. to January 2019. But it took another time, more time to prepare the paper and for it to get reviewed. And in between, we actually had say, well, when you're doing a paper with 14, you know, with a large collaboration, everyone has to check everything. And sometimes they say, mm, this sentence doesn't sound quite right. Maybe let's <laughs> rewrite this, that kind of thing. Right. The review also, the first review takes a month. And sometimes the feedback they send, most of it is constructive, but sometimes you get like the odd weirdo. Like for example, uh, in our one, when I wrote the word radial velocity, the R was a capital in mine and the reviewer was saying it should be simple, you know, little <laughs> things like that. Um, <laughs> why, why does that matter? It doesn't really, but sometimes reviewers just like pointing it out, you know. I mean, the journal we submitted it to is the monthly notice of the Royal, Royal Astronomical, Astronomical Society. Yeah. So I guess they want everything to be, you know, just perfect. So I imagine this whole thing would have been pretty exhilarating, right? Like yeah. When yeah. did you know you had it? During the discovery process, it's after we got that uh, probability, <laughs> probability assessment of that really small number. That's the moment that we actually could do a sigh of relief, right. knowing, you know what, after all our work, the spectroscopy, the transit photometry, and the dynamics, if it's still saying this, this is the probability, then we have it, you know. If this software validates it, that means we have the planet, we got it. and. Um, how did, all, it feel? Huh? How did it feel? It felt great, you know, you know, I mean, it felt great knowing we've managed to do this with minimal resources and that we managed to coordinate an international effort from Sri Lanka. How many people are involved in this? So in Sri Lanka, it's myself and my two supervisors, two supervisors, co-workers. Co so there's Mr. Saraj Kunasekar of the Arthur Clark Center and Professor Chandana Jayaratan of the University of Colombo. We concentrated on validating and studying the planet and measuring the planet. So everything from the discovery and measuring how big the planet is, what its properties are, and doing the uh, dynamics to see if it's a stable system and validating whether it's real or not, we did all that work. The other thing, other things included, we needed high resolution spe uh, images to make sure that there's no background interference from that area of the sky. We needed two people for that. One of them used something called the speckle imager. It, that's in Hawaii. And our American co collaborators was very helpful for that. And we also used something called the Danish telescope. So our American collaborator, his name is John Livingston. He's actually a very, uh, not that much older than me. And he's already a well-known man in exoplanetary astronomy because he has published a lot of papers and he's, you know, basically he's just very good at what he does. The other one called Evan, he was, he's in England. He did the other high resolution imaging and our second author, his name is uh, Tobias Hinze. He's German and he's working in South Korea at the moment. So he did a lot of work in studying the star because when, because we are looking at the planet crossing the star. We need to know the star to know the planet. So he was actually extremely important in studying the star because we don't know too much about spectroscopy. 
and he not only had managed to find a spectrum for the star, but he actually developed the tools and worked from scratch to actually study the star in detail so that our uh, paper is airtight, that nobody can eliminate, you know, eliminate our, what we did using small arguments against it. And we actually employed Tobias and a scientist from Mexico called Jesus Hernandez. He's another spectroscopist. And we also needed to include the three primary investigators, principal investigators from the Danish Telescope Consortium who collected the data for us. Mm. We also used someone to do look at the motion of the star in that particular area to know for sure where it is. So we essentially divided labors, little bits and pieces from here and there. And we all wrote our separate bits. And what I had to do was take all those things and make it look like it, you know, make it look like one person wrote it. <laughs> otherwise, it's going to, otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like. So you got, you got all the credit then? <laughs> no, oh God, no, 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 no. <laughs> Writing credit, yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, but no, that, this that is. That must uh, have been exhausting. That oh man, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about taking different writing styles yeah. and trying to integrate it together to make it seem seamless. So, and to put do corrections while doing that. So and get the R's right and the capital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I'm just trying to imagine what would have been if I got like an even bigger thing, like I don't know, maybe like a sentence wrong, like a complete sentence wrong. Oh man, but yeah, so. Uh, that's pretty much something I had to do at the end to take text from what everyone did. And sometimes I had to cut words and sometimes I had to add words just to make it flow, flow well and to make it seem like a coherent narrative. So that's just something you have to do when you're coordinating a paper. But overall, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, I'm the lead author. We have a second author. So I'm lead author because I coordinated everything and we did the actual discovery. We actually made the actual discovery and we coordinated all the other sub efforts from here. But it shouldn't be forgotten that it's at its heart a collaborative effort. And I need, I, I need to explicitly point that out because it's important for people to know that you can't do something like this on your, like exclusively on your own. You can make discoveries, you can do, I mean, we did a lot of work, but at the same time, what you can't do, you need to outsource because science is a collaborative, it's a collaborative enterprise. So at the end of the day, what matters is what you find and sharing credit is equally important because people who did something, you have to give them due credit. Right. Yeah. Of course. Now, but given that it's, uh, it's been a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. uh, this may be a dumb question, but like what, what, what makes this a Sri Lankan discovery? Uh, because we did the initial work, we did the initial work in actually finding it. Like I said, we went to thirty. Uh, we went through thirty thousand files, looking at it, and the leadership is entirely our own. Like I said, we directed efforts. It's like you know directing a movie. The director has control over where the direction of the film goes. He has to tell the cinematographer what to do and the cinematographer in turn has to tell what would you know it's like a symbiotic relationship one person a group or a group directs everything from one place and the others give their input to see what's best and then that's how it that's how it works that's why this this is a, you know this it makes this a sri lankan discovery because we found the planets we studied the planets then we took other people in to fill in the gaps where we wouldn't be able to go so it's a matter of us taking the steps, us doing all the initial studies, and then we take others in, and we use their expertise to fill in the gaps, and then we use their expertise to make what our, our paper, our discovery, airtight and much better. So yeah, that's, that's what makes it a Sri Lankan discovery. Uh, one more question. Now, um, this is obviously a very resource-intensive and labor-intensive labor mm -hmm. effort, but uh, as you said, so many exoplanets have been discovered yeah. over the past few years, right? So, like, what is what would be the barrier? What is the barrier of entry for like amateur astronomers to maybe you know get into this and maybe hopefully discover their own planets? How much effort they're willing to put into it? Right. Because, like I said, the data is available, right? And the tools are also uh, uh, can be done, and I actually think. If people throw in the effort, 
someone who is not a professional astronomer can easily make a discovery too if they're willing to put in the work. And when I say work, learn how to use Python programming because that's one of the most important things in this particular thing. Also make uh, connections with people who have access to more data because if you're publishing a paper, more data is always going to make it more airtight. So it's a matter of, like I said, effort. The effort you make to learn how to do small technical things that are definitely some things you can learn on your own. And the effort you would put into contacting people who would like to be part of what you're doing. Some things that I learned for this project actually, around this time two years ago, we didn't actually, I, I didn't have a lot of knowledge on this topic. This was, I've only been on this for two years at the moment. And as you may well imagine, there are no resources here to learn that stuff. I mean, the closest person who you could call an expert in exoplanetary astronomy is probably in, in Australia. One way that we actually learned um, how to program algorithms and do the math required to make the search algorithms and all this was actually by reverse engineering uh, what was published in other papers. So we take it, we reverse engineer the tools, then we make adjustments on our own. Like for example, in my case, I actually modified the algorithms to look specific for systems where there's more than planet, sorry, more than one planet. So that's pretty much how it goes. You have to be willing to learn something under the assumption that nobody would help you, that there's no one to help you. It would make it quicker if somebody's there to help you, but it can be done. It can be done, I mean, and you know, people can make a discovery on their own if they're actually willing to put up the work. I mean, it might take maybe several months to a year depending on how much time you have on, a, on your hands, but it can be done if somebody puts the effort to do it. So in your case, for you personally, how much time do you have to set aside to acquire these special skills that you, like for example, Python? And uh, Python, I already knew because okay. we learned that in university. Right. So that made the task a little easier. Hmm. But there are other things like Bayesian statistics, which I have never come across at the time. And unfortunately, there, isn't lot, there aren't a lot of resources online that explains it clearly. So the way I learned Bayesian st statistics is by first coding it, by developing, by coding it, and then working from there how, it, how the actual math works. But I think that's something people should be able to do because sometimes there, there isn't any good information online that explains things in a way that people who had never been in this would understand. So maybe I think this maybe you know people who are doing software design and you know software engineering might be pretty good at this. Maybe take the code, look at how the code works, and then maybe figure out. Ah, so this is the mathematical algorithm that this thing is. Yeah. <laughs> So you worked with the Arthur C. Clarke Institute. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. So what, what does the institute do? So this is actually, a, it's 33 years old. It was set up, as you may well imagine, by Arthur C. Clarke and a board of trustees. And so the main work they do there is related to space research and other things like they do work related to electronics, robotics, computer science, and they try to look for ways to make it useful in a national context, like for example, remote sensing. They do things with remote sensing. So one of the applications, one of the, what one of the scientists is working on is how to use satellite data to make sure that crops won't fail and maybe pick out which crops are most susceptible to disease, let's say. And of course, they also work on unmanned aerial vehicles, which they are planning on using for, again, for agricultural purposes. And there was talk of using it for naval work, maybe employ drones to keep track of all the fishing boats in the area and maybe use as an early warning system whenever an illegal fisher, fishing boat comes in, that kind of thing. So there you do UAV, un, sorry, unmanned aerial vehicles, they design them actually over there now. They have a whole cutting machine. They even bring the foam and all that stuff you need for uh, aerodynamic design. Uh, they also do things related to robotics and machine learning. It's 
and of course there's the astronomy division it's pretty small i mean people do astronomy including myself there's only four so yeah can we regular folk go there and play with some of these toys <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> i mean we do bring people in to show equipment every now and then okay. and there's really yeah people can come in and see if you just uh well you can just give me a call <laughs> and i can just talk with my superiors there and can arrange a visit to see everything they are doing there oh and i forgot to mention this i'm pretty sure you all all know about the ravana 1 satellite so the ravana 1 satellite was designed by two students who actually work with the center and the actual satellite tracking station is situated uh just a few meters from where i work on the fifth floor of that building so at the moment the satellite center is situated at the siklak center yeah yeah so there is there is a lot of work going on there and uh they're trying to use all this to just basically just raise up technology and raise up research for example uh my superiors in the astronomy department do a lot of outreach just a couple of weeks ago we did a workshop for students 14 and above about astronomy and that was a big success we actually had 130 people sign in even though we only expected like 50 so there is definite inter- interest and there's also a large telescope there which has been at the center for 23 years now it's it's still working quite nicely f- especially for something that was designed in the 90s and this is in uh, moroto is it yeah that's ah, okay. right. right right opposite moroto university okay. and so, uh, do yeah. uh, do regular people have access to the telescope yeah. access to the telescope i think you need to talk with the, the people there but to show how it works and everything that's not a problem we we are very happy to show how it works and just show around the labs there whenever we can So you studied physics at the University of Southampton, right? In UK. That's right, yeah. And then uh, so how did the transition from physics major to astronomy happen? Uh it's actually yeah, it's actually pretty uh, straightforward, I would say. Uh, the main thing about astronomy is you actually need to know a lot of compute computing for it because about 98% of astronomy is actually done using computer programming, com- designing algorithms and it's actually bec- it's actually using more and more ai now as well in fact uh, i'm sure you all remember the uh, the image of the black hole doing that was not an easy task and you actually needed a, a lot of new techniques develop new algorithms to do that that involved image processing and artificial intelligence where the artificial intelligence components was actually related to filling in the gaps in the images so it was a very com- advanced very amazing kind of algorithm that they used for this so computing is actually an extremely important component of astronomy and what they actually train you for physics is computing so going from physics to compute you know astronomy is basically the fact that you share computing and also the fact that a lot of things in physics are uh, can easily be applied in the context of astronomy so also any physics degree well any physics degree in in europe usa uh canada australia they all have astronomy as part of it so in my case for example uh in a semester if we have five topics there would be one which would be astronomy like that So it's not a a large leap going from a physics degree to doing astronomy. Right. Yeah. Okay. In your Twitter bio you say that you're a big fan of Carl Sagan. Oh yeah. I believe that must have had some uh, influence as well. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, Carl Sagan is an amazing communicator. I mean, if uh have you seen the TV Cosmos? Yeah, Cosmos yeah. that he did. That's actually one of the most riveting things. I even read the book on that he did on Cosmos. It's one of the most, he's one of the most riveting riveting people that uh, I've ever seen unfortunately he were, uh, he passed away i think when i was like 1 or 2 years old but he really was one of the best he's actually i think probably the best science communicator that i've ever seen and he has such a way 
with words when he's yes. <laughs> trying to convey an idea. And he was a planetary astronomer, f- first and foremost. He he actually designed the the gold plate that Voyager, went on yeah. Voyager, yeah. where he had where they had the, to the figure out a way to communicate yeah. if aliens find it about Earth and what humans are. So he's one of the people who designed it, and he worked on the Voyager probes. And one of the best things I heard from Carl Sagan was about how people can reach a conclusion without actually making any, any observations. And he actually used a very good example out of science about what people thought Venus must have been like in the 1920s. So Venus is covered in clouds, right? right. So this was something they observed even, even in using telescopes in the 1920s. So bear with me this very interesting argument they had. So they thought because Venus is cloud covered in a lot of clouds, they thought, you know what, you, you get a lot of clouds when there's a lot of water. So they thought, you know, there might, Venus might have a lot of water in it. And they thought if there's a lot of water, it's very likely that, you know, if there's, ha- there's vegetation there, it must mm. be very swampy. It must be like a swamp. <laughs> and then they tried <laughs> to go, if it's swampy, it might be warm also because there are clouds. So it might be like a warm swamp. Then they started thinking back uh, what kind of what kind of place, uh, what was Earth like when Earth was having a lot of swamps and a lot of warmth? They thought, oh, hey, the Jurassic period. So <laughs> they thought it's possible there could be large dinosaur-like creatures who could be on Venus, and you had, and there you have it. You couldn't see a thing on Venus, and the conclusion is dinosaurs. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, believe. this was in the 1920s. So this was actually a, uh, something that Carl Sagan pointed out as a prime example of reaching a conclusion uh, without actually having any concrete data to back it up, which I think is more relevant nowadays than ever, yeah. where you see some a small portion of something and then people jump to a conclusion that is not only wildly in- inaccurate, but completely bananas, if you think about it yeah. in detail. Totally enabled by the clickbait media. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, can you imagine if somebody publishes an article nowadays saying dinosaurs on Venus, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be there's going to be a lot of people who are going to look at that. <laughs> there, there were some Sri Lankan newspapers who <laughs> oh God, claimed yes. that there were bricks. Bricks were found on Mars. Did you see that? Bricks on Mars. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. it, it's not just Sri Lankan newspapers. Even the I think even the Daily Mail in the UK oh, is wow. something like that. So, so, yeah. so the so Daily is the Sri Lankan yeah. equivalent of Daily Mail. Yes. <laughs> mm. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so. It's not. It's not bricks. They're just normal rocks, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, what major projects are you planning for the future? Are you working on something right now? Or? Yeah, I'm actually working on uh, quite a few projects right now. Um, one of them is we I actually look at another planetary system. I'm not going to give any information for it on it for now because I'll, I I prefer to keep some discretion on it until we are absolutely sure what we have, but. We think it might be even more interesting than the planetary system we did find. So we are working on that. It might take a bit of time because it's very, because this one actually has a much more complicated component to it. And apparently one of the computations could take as much as two weeks, nonstop. Yeah, nonstop, two weeks. That gives you an uh, idea as to how complicated it can get. So there's that. And there's another project I'm working on it's on predicting the what some of the nearest exoplanets to Earth are like. So Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to our solar system, actually has a planet around it that is rocky, that's very likely to be rocky. Actually, I think it is rocky. And so there's another one called Bernard Star. And of course, I mentioned this one earlier called Ross 128b. Are these super Earth? Yes, okay. they are. And what I'm actually doing is I'm trying to, I'm doing a project to see, because they only know how massive these planets are. They don't know how, what, how big they are right. and what their chemical compositions might be like. So I'm actually doing a project. Uh, just yeah. interrupt you for a second. You might want to clarify uh, the difference between it's big massive and massive. And like yeah. by massive, you ah, mean mass, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So mass is essentially how, well, it's mass. It's like the difference between, say, for example, um, Dwayne Johnson is six foot four. He's six foot four, and let's say he's um, 150 kilograms. Um, at the same time, you could have a man who is morbidly obese, that's 200 kilograms, but only five foot ten. So 
mass and size are two different things. Size pretty much means how much volume something occupies. Mass means how much material is packed into it. Yeah. So same thing with planets. Uh, so you, they know how massive they are. Yeah, they know they how, know how massive how big the big planets are. are, but they don't know how big right. these things are. So how big they are could actually contribute to a lot to a, you know towards knowing things like you know if they can retain an atmosphere and right. all those things. So that's what I'm doing to figure out how big they are and using that figure out what kind of materials they have like say for example do they have a uh, iron core much bigger than what's on earth and how much heat they give out and say for example if you observe it a planet of a certain size what combination of materials would give a certain size and mass say it has an ocean if it has an ocean how big would it be no i mean how big the planet would be so just by doing a few observations work backwards see what might be on that particular planet that kind of thing yeah i'm, I'm a bit curious about the the one near proxima centauri mm-hmm. right? like yes. how, what, what do you know about it uh what a lot of scientists know right now is that it could be anywhere between 90% the size of the earth and 140% that's means 1.4 earth radii and not 0.9 earth radii but i actually use the system a different method and i managed to narrow it down some more because if you may think about it 90% 140% that's a large range right so i used a a, a different method a slightly different method from what they had done before and narrowed it down to a much much smaller range that's assuming my assumptions are correct starting assumptions are correct so what i have found at the moment is it's the same size as earth but more massive and the reason for that is that its core is much larger it has a much larger iron core and as a result of that it actually gives off more heat so say for example if you take the planet's surface the planet's surface could be receiving enough heat from the interior of the planet to the extent that it would have a ambient temperature of 8 degrees centigrade and earth gets less uh for reference it's if you take the heat alone that's emitted from the in- inside of the planet the ambient temperature would be much, much less on earth than what you get on proxima centauri b it's the planet is gone so that's one thing is and it in the habitable zone not quite oh, okay. but uh it would still be interesting to study because Wait, I'm actually I actually need to check whether if it's actually in the habitable zone because I can't quite re- I don't think I actually looked at that whether it's in the habitable zone or not but what I figured out is that like what size so I have a rough idea as to what size it should be if it has an ocean and what size it should be if it doesn't have one yeah so and another one I'm looking at is called there's a planet around this another nearby star called Bernard star I think that could be something called an ice planet that's not the interesting thing about that thing it uh so you know about that europa yeah jupiter and ganymede those two moons of jupiter they could potentially have a large ocean inside subsurface subsurface ocean that's right so but these are small moons right right i'm trying to see what would happen if you apply it to a large planet because they say the planet around bernard star is 3.2 times earth's mass right so it's obviously larger so i want to see because it's so far from the star right it's very likely that it's ice so i want to see what happens if you expand that to something what you get with moons in our solar system to a much larger planet and what kind if you can actually have an ocean underneath that could be have enough heat and uh, nutrients that can be you know good for habitation but only thing is i can only go so far because i don't have the kind of knowledge to go in a, into in depth uh literally speaking in this case about whether an ocean like that could be completely habitable and we wouldn't know for sure only until we actually study that planet using not just observations but possibly an actual spacecraft to, to go there so um, uh, yeah. given like with our current technology how many how many decades or centuries are we talking 
if you use one of our regular rockets it could be anywhere between 50,000 years and 100,000 years so but there are different methods that could actually reduce that time by a lot like for example if we actually use nuclear power to in a no rocket you could get to proxima centauri in about 16 or 17 years so it's well within the lifetime of a regular human being without needing any uh unnatural life extensions so it can be done in fact I don't know how many people know about this, but they tested a nuclear-powered rocket all the way back in the 1950s, uh, or engine. It was called Project Daedalus and pro another one called Project Orion. You can actually check that online. They even, they even have details on how good the performance of that engine was, just to put it in perspective. How, how does that work? Like, accelerate up to close to the speed of light? Is, is that the idea? No, you don't even have to go that, f that much. You just need, say... Uh, one fifth the speed of light, right. and you would get to Proxima Centauri in about seventeen years. Seventeen. Yeah, seventeen years. Yeah, because they're close enough, but you can get to higher accelerations because the thing with the rockets is mm -hmm. it depends on something called specific impulse. Right. That's how much push, mm -hmm. how much of a push you can get for a certain amount of uh, propellant for a certain mass of propellant. So, if you take regular rocket fuel. It has a specific impulse of about 45, uh, was it Newton seconds? Well, correct me if someone who can look it up because I'm very bad with units. So I remember it like Newton seconds, but correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, so it has about 45 uh, Newton seconds specific impulse. A nuclear engine would have anything between 300 and 500 spec Newton seconds of specific impulse. So it's a good a factor of 10 better that means for a certain say a certain amount of say the amount in this bottle how much He's holding thrust, a yeah, how much thrust you can get it's about if you can burn this amount of propellant right how what kind of speed can you attain how much thrust you can attain now nuclear engines are supposed to have a very good specific impulse so they would be ideal for interstellar travel and they tested this, but right now, I think the main problem isn't so much as technological, but more the... Will? Uh, sorry? The willpower or what? N not even that. It's I would say it's more the funding and right. the political yeah. connotations that... Right. Because we're talking Pretty about using a nuclear engine in yeah. space. I mean, talk of nuclear just even for a reactor gets people in a, you know, gets people in a rather... But are there serious yeah. conversations happening about it? Because all we hear in the popular media, things like, you know, solar sails and... You know. Yeah, so here's the problem. Yeah, so I don't know what the conversation surrounding it is, but there are a lot of, there are people who are trying to get that thing working. Yeah. Uh, there is another form of propulsion called iron propulsion, I-O-N, not yeah. I-R-O-N. So iron propulsion, they say, is actually is actually pretty good too. But the only problem with iron propulsion is it doesn't have a very high specific impulse. But you can use a sm you can use iron propulsion for a long time. I'm talking about if you have if you finish if you carry a certain amount of rocket fuel, it would be you do a continuous burn. It will be over in a few days. You can use iron propulsion for months and maybe even years continuously. That's basically using small particles uh, like uh, electrons and ionized gas and using electricity to push it out. And NASA and the European Space Agency are actually making a lot of progress, some magnificent progress with those things. They've even tested it in space. And you can achieve good speeds with that. It just takes a bit of time to get there. It's not as good as nuclear in terms of short-term speed. But it's pretty good. That's the main thing they're looking at. It can reach like a significant percentage of light speed. Yes, okay. but it might take a bit of time. So say nuclear can reach one-fifth the speed of light in a few days, it would take a few months for iron propulsion to do that continuous, in con to, if, you, if you accelerate it continuously. There is some conversation on nuclear, but it's not gaining the same kind of traction that iron propulsion is gaining. But I, I think they would get into it at some point. Uh, the problem with solar sails, though, is uh, the further away you get from the sun, the less effective they become. So it's not a very good uh, mode of travel for interstellar voyages. 
assuming all of these technologies fail or you know mm-hmm. we, we just stall and we don't we, we don't really develop it further at with with maybe a current existing technology do you think we would eventually maybe resort to using multi generation mul- multi generational ships to say go travel to proxima mm-hmm. centauri across like a few thousand years or like a okay. century even uh if i'm being perfectly honest i think it's much more likely we'll actually develop the technology to get there faster than using a multi generational ship uh the main thing is we don't know how multiple generations of people in a space environment whether or not they can survive because uh just a few months in space can do some very absolutely harmful things to the human body uh we are going to actually need to acclimate to that and i think some genetic tampering would be required like maybe find some way to you know uh make us more uh susceptible to low gravity environments or at least you know make us more susceptible to high radiation environments if we are to be a species that can actually travel in space for years at a time or even months at a time uh we are going to i think at some point or another we are going to need certain genetic modifications and i think in the future there will be people who would be like that you know who requires genetic modifications to travel in space you could say you know the first colonists to another planet maybe what's yeah. the current research on that is there mostly they're looking into making better life support systems right. but i don't think anyone's really <laughs> gone into you know messing with the human genetic code right. just yet i think maybe if things get desperate enough they might look start looking into it in earnest i mean there are theories flying around how it can work but uh so far most tests they've done with animals at the moment you know maybe taking dna from one animal and putting it into another and seeing you know and sometimes they manage to do it successfully so there could be something like that in the future where you know you take dna from one species mm. and put it into a person to see if they can survive better in space but uh, at the moment i think at least in the for the next 50 years i think the con- conversation should be towards taking you know going to mars, mars yeah. uh the moons of jupiter our own moon or maybe return to the moon yeah yeah, yeah. and see if you can uh set up colonies there and of course trying to make sure our own planet lasts <laughs> because let's be Absolutely, honest yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be the same in those places right what are your thoughts on the mars program i think it's good i mean the question's going to come up why colonize mars if it's you know not going to be any better than earth I actually have a different way to look at it. Other planets are actually good places for resource for resource extraction. Um uh, the asteroid belt for example has so many precious metals, so many materials and they are much easier to extract from the asteroid than it is to extract it from deep in the earth if you can get there of course. Um There's actually a asteroid I can't remember the name it has so much platinum in it they say the net worth of it is something like 440 quadrillion dollars they say if they bring all that platinum to earth it would completely destabilize the economy because the total economy on earth amounts to 78 trillion dollars so um that's how much resources there are so this is just me thinking out thinking thinking out loud since all our efforts at generating energy and resource extraction is completely screwing up the planet. Right. Why not take it elsewhere where the planets are already barren and lifeless as they are and do those there. And setting up a base on the moon or Mars is actually going to be a good way to step out. Not to mention the fact the spin-off technologies that can that can come off of it. Imagine just what kind of spin-off technologies you can get when you actually go there. There's actually a friend of mine he's a astronomer who works on dark energy and galaxy populations okay so he actually works part time with cardiologists at the uh, Imperial College Hospital uh, oh god i can't remember the name of that hospital i'll just call it the Imperial College Hospital and the <laughs> King's College Hospital in London on where the some of the cardiologists are working with him in using some of the algorithms he developed for his studies to look at heart disease trends heart disease patterns so that's a example of spin off technology is coming from space science and there are so many other examples that like from the space age there's been so many yeah, yeah yeah i mean i think uh, 
insulation uh, cap it's called captain i think that's actually something that came from uh, what they used for early rockets and even the space shuttle it's an insulating material that they develop for it and they can now use it for insulation even for things here on earth so it's a matter of you know just put it do science and good things will come of it in one way or another <laughs> And now at, at government level, there appears to be some kind of like lethargy, right? Like towards space exploration. Mm -hmm. As an astronomer, what would you, what would you suggest to like incentivize the process? Are you talking about Sri Lanka? Uh, or worldwide, or? like in the US, for example. I, 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 I think you just need, uh, you know, leaders who are actually interested in that kind of thing. Because, I mean, if you take you, the US as an example, there's more money going towards defense that let's be honest do you really need two trillion dollars on defense <laughs> i mean i don't know i mean i'm 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 not a i mean i'm not a i'm not in the military so i don't really know what the checks and balances would be on something like that but intuitively speaking that sounds like a lot um what about another space race that would certainly get things going so i think it's most likely going to be between maybe the us and china, china. most likely so and there's a possibility that this space race might be between private companies rather than on a government level. So, but then again, I think there's going to be a situation where private companies and government agencies might collaborate because as an example, so SpaceX, SpaceX has become actually a major player in uh, suborbital technology. And I'm so glad that, you know, it's happening because it's the more private entities that get into it, you know, you, you, the more likely this might actually, the technology might move forward. Uh, but there are some things that private companies can't do, like there's something called a radio thermoelectric generator. It's basically a piece of extremely radioactive material that's used as a power source. And so far at the moment, private companies can't do that because they can't politically get that kind of thing. And only people like NASA and the European Space Agency has that. And you need that to go further out into space. So odds are that you know private com so government agencies put subcontract uh, several private agencies and then use their political clout in conjunction to just have collaborative efforts. So I think that would be a nice uh, combination of public and private partnerships coming together to do something amazing. But I think the best way to get more governments invested in that would be for people, researchers in universities to produce more, you know, just somehow try to produce more research and educate the public on it because the more the public gets educated on that, the more that they would be aware of how amazing the potential of doing s astronomy and space science is as a whole to people in general. So the more you educate, the more likely it would be that politicians will pay attention to it or you know you just don't get somebody who doesn't believe in science in <laughs> you know in political <laughs> positions <laughs> one last question like mm -hmm. the kind of unrelated to any of this i understand you're a movie buff kind of yeah i am <laughs> okay so as an as a professional astronomer mm -hmm. like does that kind of impact your appreciation of certain sci-fi films, for example, like Star Wars or Star Trek mm -hmm. or things like that? Like well, Star Wars, I look, don't look at it as a sci-fi film. It's yeah, more it's not, of it's a... Not. But uh, I mean, yeah. like things like basic things like, like sound in space, does that stuff mm -hmm. bother you? Generally? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, if it's, if it's a film that's claiming to be scientifically accurate and they do something like right. that, then I'll be bothered. But for the most part, no, not really. I just enjoy them for what they are. I'm more concerned about whether... I don't know, maybe if there are cliches or if the plot makes sense or if they're doing something so mind-numbingly stupid in it. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, one of the most scientifically inaccurate movies I've seen, two of the most scientifically inaccurate movies I've seen, one of them is called Armageddon. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the other one is called The Core. The Core? I haven't seen, yeah. I haven't seen that one. Uh, not many people have seen that, but I actually enjoy both those movies, okay. despite the fact that their science is utter, utter bunk. So, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, Armageddon is uh, apparently used at NASA oh. as a training uh, video. Actually, yeah, I've heard yeah. that, actually. Yes, yeah. yes. To see if uh, new recruits can see how many mistakes they can pick out. <laughs> uh, Personally, I'm yeah. in the Deep Impact camp. Huh? 
deep impact they say it's more Similar scientific premise, yeah, like it is more science it's supposed yeah. to be more scientifically accurate but i actually prefer armageddon because it's, it's more so fun <laughs> it's so cheesy and yeah. so much yeah, fun yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense yeah i mean i can enjoy a movie uh even if it's not scientifically accurate as long as it's a fun good movie and it's you know made in good it's made with good intention so you can like temporarily forget the science and mm. just enjoy it for yeah. days I mean I don't really pick up on that too much. Okay. I mean it's only on subsequent watches that I start right. picking unless it's like a glaringly obvious one. Okay. There was a I mean there were some two real good movies recently uh, Interstellar maybe okay. you've seen it that's right. a pretty good yeah. movie yeah. although it did take some liberties with science in it. Right. but i was fine with it because it made you for mean a more the, the the rom- romantic element like about love yeah it's like uh, yeah i i didn't i didn't get that much like, i had a this? i did find it problematic not not <laughs> not because of the science aspect of it because because of that whole uh, love conquers all speech yeah that was a bit uh, that was uh, a much see that's something <laughs> that's more to do with the uh, storytelling aspects that yeah. you are that's an exposition dump which was so cheesy so needless yeah. and that shouldn't have been that kind of it was kind of like a spanner in a engine really um but things like that bother me more than uh, how scientifically inaccurate it is did, most did of the time did they understand have that standard uh, thing of like folding a piece of paper and drilling a hole through it to illustrate yeah, a wormhole yeah. like like that's yeah. like every sci-fi movie yeah. ever these days right? it does but I, i'm fine with it because yeah, that's, that's the best way to it, yeah. illustrate yeah. the uh, point yeah. Yeah. um I think they had yeah. a they had a astrophysicist on board yes keep on keep on yes yeah. in fact the black hole they did if you look at the mm. image they got mm. this year yeah they were almost you know they were actually pretty much pretty yeah. much spot, spot on, on. Yeah. in fact in fact actually interesting tidbit right in real life the black hole would look even weirder mm. but uh, Christopher Nolan decided to actually keep it the way it is because yeah. they thought if mm. they make it what it really looks like it would completely melt mm. the mind of whoever's <laughs> looking at mm. it because apparently because of how gravitationally powerful a black hole is mm. and because of how it rotates one side is actually going to look bigger than the other side yeah. and it's going to have a different color right and it's going to have different warping effects oh gosh okay. so <laughs> simply put it would just look I I actually started I actually saw a rough uh, representation of what that would look like mm-hmm. and I do agree it would completely just disorientate people to just look at the the, the damn thing and yeah I'm sure they'll save that for the yeah. sequel <laughs> 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 But uh, are there like okay what sci-fi movie or like a movie set in space mm-hmm. that that you would say is the most accurate in terms of uh, um Apollo 13 okay. it's a real life story uh that's pretty accurate Um, I I mean in terms of getting the science right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh that's that's one of them. Okay. Uh gravity is mostly good. Right. Uh the Martian is again mostly good. Okay. Um I'm trying to think what else. Movies, books, TV shows, anything. Yeah. The guy who wrote The Martian did another book called Artemis. Right. Uh it's right. Suppo- I haven't actually read it but it's supposed to be pretty good uh in a science sense. Also set in space? Yes, okay. on the moon actually. Okay. Oh. There's a film called Moon. Oh yes. yes, that was excellent. Yeah, that is pretty accurate right. in a scientific sense. Mm. So recently, they released a new f- film called Ad Astra. Mm. Uh, yeah, with Brian. I haven't seen that yet, but I haven't seen it yet either. Yeah. But yeah. apparently, my dad has it. Okay, uh, I might watch it with him. He likes sci-fi movies too. Oh, cool. But yeah, those are some uh, sci-fi movies that I think, uh, in terms of scientific, do you watch accuracy. the Expanse? Sorry, do you watch the Expanse? I watched six show? episodes of the first season, but. Uh, afterwards i actually missed it but it was a pretty good yeah um i'm 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 pre- i'm i'm going to see how uh, where it goes from there yeah, i haven't actually. read the books but i've heard the books yeah. are pretty amazing yeah. yeah i'm i'm definitely going to check that out actually okay. so because that's a pretty good i think that's a pretty good representation of what a future solar system civilized spanning civilization might be like yeah cool okay. so this has been very entertaining and illuminating Thank you very much. And yes. yeah, great was, discussion. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. It was great talking us. with you guys and I hope, you know, people listening in would learn something, learn something sure. interesting from it. So, yeah. Yes. And also how how could they con- contact you? Yeah, so there's my Facebook account, there's right. my Twitter handle. Uh That would be my at Mahesh. Uh <laughs> Don't yeah, think too much. I actually can't remember my. You can't give us spend much time on Twitter. You can't remember the own handle. Yeah, I can't. No, we'll, we'll be putting <laughs> I mean, I I do I do visit it. Okay. Yeah. But I don't but 
uh, it's just that I think when I made the account, I used the suggested name and I can't yeah. actually remember what my actual tweet. <laughs> it's just Mahesh Herat. You should be able to find it quite easily. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. We'll link it, link we'll it in link, the we'll show link, notes yeah. anyway. Okay, thanks guys. Catch you, catch you guys next time. Peace. Peace. Thank you very much. Hey guys, this is Tamara. I just wanted to thank all of you for listening in. We have been doing this podcast for more than a year now and uh, the reception has always been fantastic. So thank you for that. I also wanted to let you know that there is a new way that you can support us. We are on Patreon now. So if you head over to the badtech.com/patreon you can become a supporter and it doesn't really matter how much it is if you truly enjoy our content and if you think it's worth something you can support us and help us to keep doing this so head over to the badtech.com/patreon to do that thank you in advance even if you don't support us voluntarily there are so many other ways to support like you have always been doing you can share this podcast with your friends you can leave a review or a comment or just say hi on twitter it all means a lot we hope you guys will keep on listening thank you and goodbye until next time <laughs>